Welcome to the Electric Vehicle First Responder Safety Training. We've had about 40 people register to participate today, and we're looking forward to a very um, uh, terrific hour for you. Uh, this is the National Alternative Fuels Training Consortium Electric Vehicle First Responder Safety Training, sponsored by the Central Coast Clean Cities Coalition and the Clean Cities Coachella Valley Region. I'm Trina Wafel. NAFTC Interim Director and your MC today. First, we'll review some tips about our webinar platform, Zoom. Then I'll introduce our sponsors for today's event and um, uh, our primary sponsor, uh, the Central Coast Clean Cities Coalition, will discuss Clean Cities programs. Then I'll introduce our featured speaker and we'll move into the presentation followed by a question and answer session. So let's get started by reviewing Zoom. Please keep your microphones muted. You should have entered here with your microphones muted and we ask that you please keep them muted. <clears throat> Pets and children do have a way of cutting in. So we wanna minimize those um, distractions. And so that you can easily see the PowerPoint presentation, uh, we recommend that you select either um, speaker view or standard in the gallery view button on the top right or uh, in the view button on the top right. Standard is what I like to use. Uh, when it comes time for questions and answers, um, please use the chat feature. It's a message balloon icon in the bottom center of your screen. If you have difficulties at, at all during this event, um, you can email our uh, Zoom um, technical assistant. His name is Julian Arego, and he is at julian.arego at mail.wvu.edu, and he'll be monitoring his inbox to see if anyone's having trouble. We are recording today's event. You'll be receiving an email from our Clean City sponsors after today's event that will include a link to the webinar for later viewing and a tip sheet about some of the information you've heard today. Now, many of us are still on a learning curve. Me is charged, guilty as charged in this brave new world of virtual meetings. So please bear with us if there are a few glitches from time to time. Now I'd like to introduce our wonderful sponsors. Our primary sponsor for today's event is the Central Coast Clean Cities Coalition, headed by Alex Economou as the C5 coordinator and an air quality specialist for the Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District in Santa Barbara, California. He has been involved with C5 since 2015, becoming the coalition's coordinator in 2020. C5 is a group of local stakeholders whose mission is to expand the use of alternative fuel vehicles and fueling infrastructure in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties. And from the Clean Cities Coachella Valley region, we have our secondary sponsor today, Ms. Georgia Sevright, who serves as coordinator and, and program manager there in Coachella Valley. She manages and directs the overall organization planning and programmatic tasks related to the coalition. Ms. Sevright collaborates with others to develop regional and corporate initiatives to advance the economy, protect the environment, and promote energy security by supporting local actions to reduce petroleum in transportation. I'd like to turn the screen over now to today's lead sponsor, Mr. Alex Economou, for a few words about the Clean Cities Coalitions. Alex, you can share your screen now. All right, thanks, Trina. Just bear with me as I share my screen. All right, hello everybody. Good morning and thank you for joining today's first responder safety training on electric vehicles. As Trina mentioned, my name is Alex Economou and I'm the coordinator of the Central Coast Clean Cities Coalition, or C5. First responder safety training is a very important topic and as more and more EVs enter the market, being trained on electric vehicles is becoming increasingly important. Before I turn things over to our trainer, Chris, I wanted to give a brief overview of the Clean Cities program, as well as provide some local EV context in our region. C5 and Clean Cities Coachella Valley region are part of a broader network of Clean Cities coalitions across the country and are part of the US Department of Energy's Clean Cities program. Part of what our coalitions do is to organize trainings such as the one today and conduct outreach to promote alternative fuel vehicles and fueling infrastructure. 
This slide helps to give a sense of just how broad our network of Clean Cities coalitions is nationally and where local coalitions are located. As a part of the national network, our coalitions have access to a wide range of tools and resources from the Department of Energy and national labs, which we can leverage to help support local stakeholders in our regions. Before we dive into today's training, we wanted to provide a little context for the electric vehicle market in California. By now, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with seeing electric vehicles driving around, but they still make up a relatively small percentage of the vehicles on the road today. As of the end of 2019, only about 2% of the cars on the road in California were electric vehicles. However, over the last few years, California has set ambitious goals to get more EVs on the road, including a goal of 1.5 million zero emission vehicles on the road by 2025 and 5 million zero emission vehicles on the road by 2030. Additionally, the governor recently issued an executive order requiring that all sales of new passenger cars be zero emission vehicles by 2035. While there still is a long way to go to reach these milestones, the EV market is moving in the right direction. Through the first three quarters of 2020, roughly 7.7% of light duty vehicle sales in California were electric. This trend coupled with federal, state, and local incentives that are currently available paint a promising picture for the future of electric vehicles statewide. This slide gives you an idea of how many electric vehicles are on the road locally, as well as the number of public EV charging stations that are available in our region. While still a relatively small number, EVs are a technology that is becoming more and more prevalent in today's society and a trend that cannot be ignored. And then with that, here is Georgia and my contact information, and I will turn things back over to you, Trina, so that you can introduce our trainer for today's training. Thank you, Alex. We appreciate your support of today's webinar, both you and Georgia. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our featured presenter, Captain Chris Womack of the Indianapolis Fire Department. He's been with the Indianapolis Fire Department for about 24 years. During that time, he has served as a Lieutenant on an engine and as part of the fire administration in the special ops division as the rescue coordinator. He was responsible for 15 extrication tactical teams where he handled training, purchasing and managing operating procedures. He's in the process of obtaining his bachelor's degree in fire administration right now. He's been training about alternative fuel and electric vehicles um, for the first responder safety training for NAFTC for the past five years. He's provided training across the country from the National Fire Academy in Maryland to sites in California. And if some of you have attended one of our previous trainings, you may have had a chance to meet him. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Captain Womack. Um, go ahead and please share your screen. And thank you for sharing your expertise. Well, I appreciate it. I'm um, gonna pull up my slide presentation here and I get started. All right. All right, so to give you a little bit more information about myself as well, um, like I said, I have been in the fire service for a little bit. Um, I actually, I need to update my market profile, I guess, a little bit. I just started my 25th year here with the Indianapolis Fire Department. I've uh, been in the fire service total for uh, about 29 years now. I am uh, back in the companies. I am a, a captain on, on an engine. Um, I have spent um, a few years as a lieutenant on one of the business engines in the city of Indianapolis. Um, before that, I, I was in administration. I was uh, in the special ops division. And, you know, with that, uh, this is how I got started with teaching this class. So kind of give you a, a quick story, but, you know, in the fire service, there's no quick stories, but uh, I'll try to make it brief. So basically, I got started um, in this program. Uh, I was in the administration. I was in the special ops division, and this was probably about seven years ago or so. Um, and the question came to me when we were doing an extrication training, what do we do if we encounter an electric vehicle? Um, how do we do extrications? Uh, will we get electrocuted if we come in contact with things um, we're not supposed to? 
And, you know, my answer to that was no, I, I don't know. You know, my job was to try to figure out the information and disseminate that information to uh, the crews. So I started out uh, with a couple of trainer trainer courses. The first course I started out with was uh, an NFPA course. Um, during that time, the only course that was out there was NFPA and it was just strictly 100% uh, electric vehicles. Um, and during that training, like I say, it was still pretty much new to everybody, especially in the fire service. So, you know, it was kind of uh, a little bit of like teaser information. It gave you a little brief information, uh, just enough to almost like get you in trouble, I guess, so to speak. So I also reached out to uh, different organizations to try to learn as well. So I was reached out to uh, NFTC. It actually came up to Indianapolis and did a trainer trainer course uh, there. So I attended one of those. I actually attended about two or three as they came to Indianapolis. And I also went to West Virginia University for a week long course to uh, you know try to learn a little bit more information, a little bit more in depth about the cars. Um, during this uh, time period, um, NFTC was fairly new to the first responder training world. So basically during that time, they had um, a, a gentleman that actually was uh, a service tech that was teaching first responders on how to deal with these cars. And of course, those of us that, you know, been in fire service a long time, we don't really um, do well with uh, someone teaching us outside of the, uh, you know, the fire service world because they don't necessarily know or understand what our job entails when it involves an accident. So when you get a service tech that's trying to teach firefighters how to deal with this car, they're more teaching the service aspect of it, some of the features of the car. And we really don't want to know or don't necessarily need to know the, all the ins and outs of these vehicles. We just need to know what do we do when the vehicle's on fire or crash, right? I mean, we try to keep things simple in a fire service world. You know, it goes back to the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid, right? So that's where I came in, um, you know, five or so uh, plus years ago with NFTC. You know, we, we uh, started talking about uh, first responders, a lot of evaluations came back and said they wanted to hear from first responders. So we had a couple of instances in Indianapolis that uh, also that I reached out to NFTC and that kind of made me, uh, I guess, the go to guy, I guess, so to speak, on our department on how to deal with these emergencies. So that's kind of how I got started with this. It wasn't necessarily the fact that I stayed at Holiday Inn Express once or the fact that, you know, you know how firefighters are, you know, they sit in a recliner all day long and they Monday morning quarterback uh, an incident that happens somewhere in the country, then they become an instructor. So it was one of those things where I actually tried to reach out and try to educate myself uh, as much as possible. Because uh, like I said, we did have a couple of close calls um, in Indianapolis. So, you know, just to give you, like I said, just a little information about me. So we'll uh, dive into here. Uh, and, you know, you are getting an abbreviated course. I mean, this course is usually uh, six to seven hour, you know, in-person class. Um, and during that class, what we do is we actually not only talk about the vehicles, we don't talk about emergency situations. We also do scenarios, but we also have the opportunity to uh, walk around a lot of vehicles and see different types of vehicles. Um, you know, having this uh, relationship with the uh, Clean City Coalitions, they actually have access and relationships with many dealerships and many different uh fleet services that have these vehicles and they'll actually bring them out to us or we can actually look over them, uh, whether it be an electric vehicle or alternative fuel or a, any type of gaseous vehicle. So that's also good to have that hands on. So like I said, you are getting a, a brief one hour segment or a teaser, if you will, uh, of this course. And like I said, we enjoy doing uh, in-person classes. Um, I like interacting with other firefighters. And too, like I said, we kind of share stories too. Because there's maybe some instances you may have had and, and we'll discuss in the classroom as well. You know, I, like I said, I've been in the fire service a very long time. And even on the street, you know, there's something I learn every single day. Um, I always tell people, uh, especially younger generations, stay away from the firefighters that say they think they know everything because no one can actually know half the thing involving our job because it's evolving every single day. So not only, like I said, you know, during teachings, I, I learned something doing that. I also learned something when I'm, I'm taking these runs every day as well. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna turn my camera also, um, basically you'll be able to see uh, in the slides, okay? So we'll get started. If I get my slides to work. So a couple of things that we're gonna talk about in this class is 
you know, we're going to talk about identifying the vehicles. That's one thing that's one of them, one of the most important things out of this class is, you know, we assume a lot of things in the fire service. One of the biggest things we assume is if we don't hear a vehicle running, we're going to assume that vehicle is turned off or powered down. And that could be a, a disastrous for us when you talk about silent movement, because believe it or not, I mean, you're not going to hear anything um, with these cars. Uh, actually, I was uh, reading a story just yesterday. There was uh, someone is trying to uh, sue Elon Musk and Tesla because of their vehicles of uh, uh, killing their cats because the cats don't hear the vehicle to get out of the way of it. So, um, so they are pretty quiet. You know? And like I said, I'm an animal lover too. So if anybody got offended by that, I'm sorry. But like I said, but that's you know the, the nature of the beast. I mean, these cars are very quiet. You don't hear them. Okay. So a couple of things we're also going to talk about. We're going to talk about uh, high voltage cables. Uh, we'll talk briefly on like where they run. Um, you'll hear a lot of stories or a lot of people tell you that uh, they're, gonna, they're not in what you call typical cut places or cut points on these vehicles. But, you know, in our world, what is a typical cut point? You know, we do a lot of different types of cuts on these vehicles, depending on the emergency or the uh, extrication that we need to do. So we need to try, you know, try to get away from what they call typical cut points, because these orange cables can be located in multiple areas on this vehicle. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, vehicle fires too, extinguishers, what type of extinguisher do you use for electrical fire or vehicle fire or whatever, but just to give you a, a spoiler alert, just use water just like you do in a conventional vehicle. So that part is already taken care of. So this vehicle um, is, is a little different. This is a 100% electric vehicle. This is a car sharing program that actually started in Indianapolis. Uh, and I say started because now it's no longer here. But, but from my understanding, this company also took their business out to uh, LA uh, and it's Chicago as well. So it's called, it's called a Bellore. Uh, it's a French company um, that uh, brought these cars over. It's a car sharing program that you'll see, start seeing a lot um, popping up all over the country. So these car sharing programs are bringing fleets of vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, along with charging stations um, to uh, operate within their cities. So it's basically, it takes place of an Uber or a Lyft, but now you're the driver of that vehicle. So you're seeing these uh, uh, pop up. So when uh, Alex was talking about the 2% uh, of the vehicles on the roadways there are electric vehicles, you know, and I said, it must be a huge 2% because I mean, the last couple of times I was out to, in California teaching, it seemed like everywhere I turned, there was an electric vehicle somewhere. I mean, there's Teslas uh, everywhere and Priuses, uh, you know, so, so they're definitely, definitely out there. Okay. Now my slides stop working. All right. Here we go. So some of the safety features built into these vehicles. So, you know, we got, we got active and passive, just like in a conventional vehicle, there's uh, safety systems built into those cars as well. So, it, you know, you get involved in an accident involving a, a conventional vehicle. You have these, uh, you know, switches that actually will shut down the fuel system of that vehicle. Same systems are located in these electric vehicles as well. So there's a couple other safety features they've actually added. You know, when we talk about the high voltage system. So when we come across an accident or an extrication, um, you know, the biggest fear is what do we do? Can we touch this vehicle without becoming electrocuted? Because, you know, in the fire service, we fear what we don't know, right? So, and I'd still hear of agencies all over the country that have a hands-off approach when it comes to electric vehicles because they're terrified of the car. They don't know about it, so that instills fear. So these safety features that are in these cars are built for not only uh, the passengers, but also for first responders as well. So some of the safety features we'll talk about in these vehicles is um, say fault detection. So if the electrical system detects a short or a damaged cable, it would actually shut down the high voltage system and isolate the power just into the battery itself. If an airbag deploys, you know, it would shut down the high voltage systems as well. But how many times have we gone in a car accident? You know, you see a car that's, you know, tore pretty well and you don't hear, you don't see an airbag deployment. Sometimes it makes you scratch your head. So there's other safety features that are uh, act uh, as well. So not only the fault detection, not only the airbag, but you also have impact detection. So if that vehicle detects some kind of a, a collision or an impact, even without the airbag going off, it will actually shut down the high voltage system, just the same as it would if you were a conventional vehicle. Because you know, impact detection um, and airbag detection usually shuts down the fuel system in a vehicle, same way it would in these uh, electric vehicles as well. So when we talk about, even though these safety fit, uh, features have activated, 
complicated. We still don't want to touch anything that's orange, um, you know, such as like the orange cabling. You got service disconnects. And it, like I said, every, there's a video on YouTube for everything. So there's actually guys, um, firefighters on YouTube that will show you that you can cut the high voltage cabling without any problem. You know, in the fire service, uh, and I'll say it many times, because a lot of things happen in the fire service, right? Because Murphy, we, you know, we're at his mercy. Murphy likes to rear his ugly head a lot of times. I tell people in this job, you know, no matter what it is, you may be able to get away with something, you know, 99 times, but all it takes is one time become uh, part of firefightersclosecalls.com or uh, part of a fire department funeral. Okay, so just because you were able to get away with something once or twice doesn't necessarily make it, you know, practice. And that's what we do in the fire service. If we see someone's able to do it once, well, if they do it, if they, you know, if it happened, they did it safely, then maybe we can be able to do it. No, there's a lot of things that go into play with that. So you'll see guys with uh, videos, they'll take the high voltage cables out. And like I said, you can look it up on YouTube and they actually put it on a two by four and take a cutter and they'll actually cut the high voltage cable. You'll see this large spark uh, or whatever, and they cut through it and they say, see, nothing happened. But there's also ramifications from that too as well. So when they got done cutting, they show you the, uh, the tips or the blades of the cutter and actually pitted those blades. And if anybody is involved with purchasing extrication equipment or equipment for the fire department, those blades are not cheap. They're about $1,500 to $2,000. So therefore we already know in the municipalities, it's hard to get funding for things that we absolutely need. So why are we do damage uh, to equipment that we know we're probably not gonna get replaced anytime soon. And we may need later on down the road. Second, they actually put this high voltage cable on a two by four. So even though there are cars that are called woodies, believe it or not, there's not too many cars on a roadway that are actually made of wood because we know wood doesn't conduct electricity, right? So when we're doing these extrications, we're dealing on a metal vehicle. Uh, sometimes we're doing it, uh, well, at least in the Midwest, there's rain or wet pavement involved. I know you guys don't get too much uh, wet stuff out there on the West Coast, but you know these are also things that uh, conduct electricity, such as water and metal. So I tell people, if you see anything orange in these, on these vehicles, you leave it alone. So don't cut the high voltage cable. Don't pull a service disconnect. You'll also see material out there that says, hey, if you want to kill the high voltage systems on these vehicles, pull a service disconnect. And that is a, a disaster too. Because say you take your Prius or your Tesla to, um, to the dealership. The first thing that uh, service tech has to do is they have to pull the service disconnect, you know, to disable that vehicle. So in order to do that, there's a process. They have to take the key fob and they have to remove that key fob at least 20, 25 feet away, put it in a box. Because if that key fob is anywhere near the vehicle, as you pull that service disconnect, that uh, service disconnect and arc. And that arc can be uh, very dangerous or harmful to the individual pulling. So after they take the key fob, put it in a secure location, then they put it on insulated lineman gloves and then pull it the service disconnect to avoid electrocution. So let's talk about insulated lineman gloves for a minute. And I know there's some agencies, there's some departments that actually uh, carry these gloves on their apparatus as part of their equipment. And to me, uh, it's, it's a huge liability because one, when you talk to a, a lineman or an electrician that has these gloves, they do a daily check of their gloves and their equipment. It's a two part glove. So you have the inner part of that glove is like a, a rubber glove or like, you know, similar to what you call a kitchen glove. What they do is they blow air into that glove and they tie it into a knot. That glove has got to be able to hold that air in that glove without any leakage because a hold as small as a pin, a pinhole, can be fatal to a, a lineman if he's encountered anything that's live. Also, the outer glove is more like a, our fire department gloves, like a, that um, uh, leather glove type, okay? So when we talk about daily checks on apparatus, you know, I, I know uh, like engineers or, or whoever does your daily checks, how do we normally do daily checks on a fire apparatus? Do we go through every single compartment, every little tool, nook and cranny and test them out? Well. We all know the answer to that, pretty much no. You know, especially on a Sunday morning, you come in, you're tired from the night before, you're doing your apparatus checks and basically you just go up, yep, it looks like it's there and you do a check mark on it, okay? So are we gonna have crews sit there and do um, checks like they're supposed to? Are they gonna inflate that glove every single day? No. So 
I always say, leave that stuff alone. Insulated lining gloves are, you know, uh, very dangerous. Okay. So we took a lot of warning placards. There's things underneath the car to identify where these vehicles are, are high voltage or electric vehicles. So when we open up the hood or do any kind of um, uh, inspection of these vehicles, say we got a vehicle on its side, we got a vehicle that's crashed, we look underneath the hood, we're trying to find a 12 volt battery. We see these stickers that says high voltage inside, that should be an indicator that we're dealing with an electric or a hybrid type vehicle. So the color coding in these vehicles, the only standard colorization in these vehicles that you're going to find is the orange cable, which means you're dealing with high voltage. Now, you're going to see some other cables in there that could be blue, you could be um, yellow, possibly. Um, those things are what they call intermediate voltage, okay? But I would still consider those as high voltage, anything more than a 12-volt battery. You know, I tell uh, every firefighter, you know, like Hitch, if anybody's seen the movie Hitch, Red and black is where we live all day long. And red and black cables basically is your 12 volt battery. So when we open up that uh, the hood or we want to isolate the power to that vehicle, we cut the 12 volt battery in a conventional vehicle. So we do the same thing here. Because remember when we talk about safety features, if that vehicle detects a fault in an electrical system, it will shut down the high voltage system. Same thing here. In that high voltage system, and there's what they call a relay, high voltage relay, which is operated and powered by the 12 volt battery. So when the power's onto this vehicle, that relay is in a closed position or in line position. So when we turn the vehicle off or we cut the 12 volt battery, that relay will open up, it will shut down the high voltage system and actually isolate all the power into the high voltage battery itself. So therefore, when we're talking about disabling uh, the battery uh, on these types of vehicles or conventional vehicle we do it the same way we find a 12 volt battery if we can and then and we cut the, the 12 volt battery to isolate that power now i tell people don't spend too much time uh trying to find that battery because like for my department for instance if we pull up on a, an extrication run we're throwing 25 to 30 firefighters on scene right off the bat so i've got manpower for days you know if i wanted to you know task one person with trying to find a 12 volt battery i can do that smaller departments don't have that luxury. Um, I was in Louisiana last week or last month teaching a class and on an extrication run, they were lucky to get six to seven people on an extrication run. So therefore your manpower is, you know, critical, it's crucial. You got to have uh, everybody all hands on deck to get a task done. So therefore we rely on the safety features built into these cars to shut that high voltage system down. So like I said, these 12 volt batteries can be located in many different areas of this vehicle. You'll find some underneath the hood. You can find some underneath the passenger seat uh, in the rear of the car. You'll find some on the passenger seat in the front of the car. There's even some brands that you may even find a 12 volt battery underneath the driver's seat of that vehicle. So just imagine how complicated that would be if we actually had to do an extrication. How are we going to get the 12 volt battery? We can't even get to the patient. So that's why I say we rely on some of these safety features built into these cars um, before we start, uh, you know, try to find a 12 volt battery, wasting time doing that. And you'll see, like I said, I'll go through some of these PowerPoints uh, pretty quick. I'm not a PowerPoint type instructor. Um, I leave uh, some of this information so you guys can have something to read and, and look at as well. Um, because like I said, I, you know, you hear the term death by PowerPoint in the fire service. You know, I'm not at one that likes to attend classes and see an instructor just read uh, uh, a PowerPoint word for word. To me, that's kind of uh, insulting to my intelligence because, you know, believe it or not, you know, I am a fireman, but I do can read, even though you throw some pictures in there, you get my tension a little bit more, right? Okay, so we talk about the high voltage system. Now, let's talk about some of the other things that are associated with uh, electric vehicles. So when I tell people, uh, so when I tell people um, about the charging stations, you know, charging stations actually scare me a little bit more than the vehicles themselves, just because there's some other uh, hazards and risks involved with, with the uh, charging stations versus the cars. So when we talk about the charging stations, you know, we talk about the three different levels. You got a level one, you got a level two and a level three. So with the level one uh, charge station is basically um, what you would get if you purchased your vehicle itself. So you purchase your vehicle, um, like let's say a Nissan Leaf, a Chevy Volt, Prius, whatever. You're actually given a level one charger, which actually uses a 110 uh, volt 
120 volts, you plug into your 110 outlet in your garage, whatever, and it charges your vehicle. It takes about uh, eight to 10. Uh, so sometimes it may be a little bit longer depending on how uh, low your battery is. So the problem with the level one chargers uh, is sometimes people don't have um, outlets in convenient spots in the garages. So sometimes they'll try to use an extension cord to extend that reach. And when you do that, you can't use a typical extension cord or actually they'd recommend you not to use any extension cord because the extension cord is not ready to take that power to uh, charge that vehicle. So therefore we're seeing uh, fires, residential fires being caused by these, you know, just like anybody else, you know, if you see someone that doesn't have power in their house, what do they do? They run an extension cord from the neighbor's house and, and power their own homes up. So it becomes a problem for for us as firefighters, because now we've got an electrical fire, but we don't know what caused the fire. You first, know, we come across something like this, we got a high voltage vehicle that's uh, powering that. So the first thing we do when we come across a house fire is what well, we want to try to isolate the power. We turn the power off to that, to that residence, right? Okay, so if we got a car in there that's uh, being a power source, then that can be a problem. And that's when we come into the level two chargers, because we talk about the level two chargers, which is about 220, 240 volts. Um, these our charging stations have to be uh, installed by an ele a certified electrician. These are similar to a, a hot tub. If you had a hot tub installed into your home, it has to have its own breaker system, own breaker box to kill power to it. So when you talk about having a certified electrician install one of these into your home, so you're talking about big money, big costs, right? So when we do that, you know, we don't want to spend that kind of money. Right. We want to try to save as much money as we can. So what we get, we get our next door neighbor says, hey, guess what? I can put that in for you for a case of beer. Right. So we start running into problems with these. So these guys are installing these uh, uh, level two charging stations in these homes, you know, without uh, proper uh, fault detection and become problems for us as well. And I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody saw the new uh, Ford commercial during Christmas time, the whole Christmas vacation. Thing. So you're starting to see um, that technology where they actually, well, he couldn't get the lights to turn onto the house. So what uh, did Audrey do? She turned um, to the garage and actually plugged the car into the house and used the house as a generator. So that is also another thing that we're going to be seeing here with these vehicles as well. So when we see um, that technology when it comes out, let's say you're sitting at home or whatever, and I know California, you guys do a lot of uh, uh, brownouts or uh, whatever during uh, high wind season or whatever. So let's say you have a situation where your power is killed to your house and you're in the middle of watching the big game or whatever. And you're like, oh, I have no power. So now you'll be able to use your vehicle as a backup generator and uh, power your house through your vehicle as well. So we'll go back to the house thing, a house fire. So that becomes a problem for us. So if we kill the power to the house, we have a structural fire, but this car is still plugged in into the garage, this car will be able to have potential to um, backfeed into that house and actually energize everything inside that house. So these are things, like I said, it, it, like I said, that's why it terrifies me a little bit more than the vehicles themselves, because there's so much new technology out there. How are we going to handle that um, when we're dealing with uh, residential fires or fires involving uh, charging stations? So we talk about level three. Level three is a, what they call the supercharger or fast charging stations, 480 volts. Now, when we talk about 480 volts, that is a, a lot of power. And usually with Tesla, they have those supercharging stations that are typically about five or six cars they can actually charge at one time. The level three charging station has a large transformer that actually powers this whole uh, entire system. Okay, so we're talking about um, emergency responses, you know, a shortage or, you know, someone runs over one of these, you know, these level threes are also powered sometimes by solar panels as well. So you're familiar with solar panels, you know, that's a lot of electricity coming here for storage. And so therefore we deal with emergencies. How do we handle those type of things? So, which is a very good question and leads me to coming up if I can get my PowerPoint to keep freezing up on me. So we talked about charging station, we talk about all these power. So level two is like the, this charger you'll see here. These are what you're going to see in a commercial setting, like at your malls, your restaurants, uh, your hotels. Now, the biggest problem with this, uh, these are charging stations uh, here in Indianapolis. If you look in front of that, there is not much room uh, from the curb. 
You know, so we talk about vehicles. We have a lot of vehicles that run into houses. We have vehicles that run into buildings. So just imagine someone trying to parallel their car into this parking spot. What keeps them from running over one of these charging stations? Remember, this is a type two. So you talk about 240 volts coming up from underneath there. You know, a lot of these uh, companies or some companies actually put ballards in front of them. So people do not accidentally run over them and park on top of them. Because if you look at this, you know, whether it be law enforcement or uh, EMS personnel, which I also teach uh, as well, you see a car parked on top of one of these things, you're gonna assume that that's gonna be a possible parking meter, right? So if you got two, a car sitting on top of uh, a cable that uh, has 240 volts coming to it, what do you think the problem is gonna uh, be in that situation? So now you're gonna have an energized car by uh, a power line underneath. So how do we handle emergencies involving that? One, I tell people, one, know your district. And there's apps out there like PlugShare, uh, Department of Energy also has one. Um, we can actually locate your charging stations. In my district, uh, we have tons of charging stations. So if I get a car accident in a certain location in my district, I'm already thinking, okay, if this car is on the sidewalk, I know I've got charging stations there. How am I going to get the power to this thing? So when I was in the office, um, part of the in special office division, they were installing these. And my recommendation was, let's put shutoffs to these charging stations. So if we do have an incident, we can kill the power to them. So this pedestal is what they call the meter pedestal. Basically this one just monitors how much electricity is being used. This pedestal is actually uh, the shutoff for it. So you see there's a little padlock there. Um, this one was before we actually had them put stickers on it. So right above that padlock, there'd be a sticker that says fire department use only. So what we would do is take the bolt cutters, we open up this, um, we'll cut the padlock off, we open it up. Oh, there's one with the, the sticker on it. It's a different um, um, look on it. So it has a sticker that says for fire department use only. We cut the padlock off, we open it up, and inside of it, it looks like a little breaker box or even a switch. What we do is we would shut the power off to the whole charging station, not just the one charger, but the whole charging station itself. We also had them put a padlock inside the charging station so we could re-secure it. So we practice our lockout tag out. So we re-secure that, lock it back up. We kill the power to the whole charging station. Because we know if we don't do that, uh, public, you know, they're going to be inconvenienced, right? So they're going to come back and throw the power back on because they want to charge their car, right? It's a me, me, me society. It's all about safety. So now let's say we didn't have uh, a shutoff uh, kiosk to our charge station. How do we kill the power to this? And that is a, you know, one of the biggest questions we run into across the country because there was no standardization when they installed these charging stations. You know how technology supersedes code. So they start installing these things and, and there was no shutoffs. So basically we do have some in our city that do not have shutoffs. So basically what we did was I wrote a, an SOP that basically mirrored my power line SOP. So if I had a, a charging station that was compromised or a car parked on top of it, we would treat it just like it was a live power line. And so therefore we called a power company to come out, kill the power to that grid before we actually did anything to it. So when you start doing that a couple of times, businesses get a little upset because now you're killing power to their company, to their business and they're losing money. So that is also something you need to find out that's in your area. Where are your charge stations? Where are your charging stations located? And do you have uh, shutoffs for them? And if you don't, you know, write an SOP to make sure everybody's aware on how and what the process is to kill the power to these charging stations as well. Okay. So we talked about the whole uh, charging stations. So let's talk about a little bit about first responder procedures. What do we do if we come across an accident involving uh, an electric vehicle or a charging station. So we do it just like we do everything else. You know, we approach the scene, we do our scene size up, you know, we identify what our situation is, you know, mobilize the vehicle just like we do on everything else. You know, then we do extrication, deal with leaking fuels or whatever fires we, we tend to. So we talk about apparatus placement. You know, if anybody's ever done uh, Tim's training or um, it's our end time training, it's a good training to go to. It actually talks about how to place your apparatus in certain positions. Now, this for us, we want to talk about how do you approach that vehicle? You know, we always want to approach the vehicle from a 45 degree angle because it does two things for us. One, we can identify the type of vehicle uh, at a 45 degree angle and we're not putting ourselves in harm's way for that silent movement. 
you know, where that car goes forward or backwards. Um, you know, we don't want to be on YouTube um, being ran over by a car, right? So approaching from a 45, we can do a couple different things. We're looking for emblems. We're looking for badging on that vehicle to determine, you know, whether that thing is going to be electric or a hybrid vehicle. Uh, remember, the only thing we ever assume when dealing with these emergencies as we're going to assume that every single vehicle we come across is either going to be a hybrid or alternative fuel vehicle until we can prove otherwise. So, like I said, we're making that car tell us what it actually is, right? So, this is what I was talking about uh, when we were talking about uh, Tim Strain. It's a, a good class, it's a FEMA class. Um, it's, a, it's a very good class to, to attend. So we talk about just like in every single thing, we don't rush in. You know, it's not like the movies, you know, you see a car accident and everybody's sprinting with a tech box and, and monitor everything is. You know, we got to do our due diligence. We, you know, we check the scene, make sure we don't become part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution. So and I'm pretty sure just like us, we have situations or uh, bad problems with overdoses. So when we talk about immobilizing that vehicle, you know, turning the vehicle off is, is one of the biggest things, you know, maybe the only immobilization you need to do. But also when you approach that vehicle, approaching from a 45, because like I said, we don't want to be part of the problem, we want to be part of the solution. We've had a couple of instances where we have an overdose and you approach a vehicle that's always slumped over there in the uh, driver's side of the vehicle and that car is still either in drive or reverse. And the only thing that's keeping it there is sure will. You know, so the person's passed out. And like I said, I got a girlfriend who's a paramedic. She uh, works on the ambulance here in the city. And uh, I made her take one of my classes because we were down in Louisiana one time and she'd never been. And um, so I said, if you want to go attend one of my classes and we start talking about the immobilization part. And she goes, oh, that, you know, that's a pretty good idea. So believe it or not, we come back home. Uh, about a week later, she has an incident involving an overdose. And, um, you know, the fire crew gets there first. You got a guy that's slumped over in the driver's side. The car, and of course, firefighters, you know, we, we don't think too much, you know, we like Mongo. So they start beating on the window to try to wake the driver up. I and mean, she, you know, stops and says, hey, why don't you guys chalk the wheels first before you try to wake him up? And I said, oh, that's a pretty good idea. So they chalk the wheels and they started to uh, tap on the window again. The guy happened to wake up. He took his foot off the uh, brake and the car started wanted to move. So if they didn't have the wheels chalked, you know, you know, who knows what happened. Someone either would have got hit by a car or an apparatus would have got hit. But that's the only time I've ever said a woman actually ever listened to any advice I had to say. So, you know, so it was a win-win for me. But we, I've had the same incident where I had a, a drunk driver as well, did the exact same thing. You know, he was um, over a median or whatever, his car was still in park, um, had a, a pop out a window. Uh, they reach in there before we tap in there. We got the wheels chalked. And I was able to put the uh, vehicle in park and by the, I think the park was the trigger because the guy woke up right at that moment and hit the gas pedal and tried to take off. So luckily, you know, we already had it in park before, you know, after we had chalk the wheels. So it's also good just to chalk the wheels, whether if you're dealing with a conventional vehicle or uh, electric vehicle as well. So it's a good practice to get into. We don't think about a lot of those things until it actually happens, right? Because in the fire service, what? We're more reactive instead of proactive. So mobilizing a vehicle uh, is important. So like I said, go back to, let's say we do have an electric vehicle. You know, we talk about uh, extrication or whatever. Simply reaching inside that, hitting the uh, power button to that vehicle and taking the key fob out of that vehicle may be the only thing we need to do to immobilize that vehicle, okay? Then stabilize. All right, now let's talk about badging. This is how we identify vehicles, right? We're looking for things on there that says either synergy drive. We're looking for things that says hybrid. Um, we have some manufacturers that are, you know, want to be cool, but not necessarily with the cool kids. So they'll do something a little different like Lexus and Mercedes. Um, I believe, I think the Lexus, um, they'll have a number with a lowercase h at the end of it to identify it being a hybrid vehicle. Whereas Mercedes, they have a lowercase e at the end of the number to identify their hybrid uh, version of that vehicle. Also look for blue emblems on some of these vehicles too. Like the Toyota, um, I think um, Hyundai um, also has like the blue uh, accents, the BMW also as well on the, like you talk about the i3. So you look for those uh, emblems too, or uh, different color to tell you what type of vehicle you're dealing with too, okay? Look underneath the hood, looking for dash instruments. Like you can see the Model S. You see something that looks like, like uh, the Star Trek Enterprise or something like that. You know, that may pique your interest. If you see something that says um, like battery power, how much you have until the battery's 
depleted, that'd be an indicator. Okay, distinct profiles of vehicles like the Chevy Volt, the Prius, Teslas, you know, we automatically know those vehicles are going to be electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. So, you know, notify things or um, take notice to these types of things. You know, look for the fuel ports. You know, most times I used to say that if you see uh, a fuel port or something that's on the driver's side vehicle in front of the driver's side door, nine times out of 10, you're going to be dealing with the electric or hybrid vehicle. But, you know, we have to think uh, a little different, too, because some of these charging ports are also going to be in the same areas where you see a conventional um, fuel tank port as well. OK. So it's like this, uh, this truck here, this was an aftermarket deal. So if I was to pull up and I just did not see this truck plugged in, I would have never assumed that this was an electric vehicle or, or I'm sorry, a hybrid vehicle. OK, being plugged in gives me. He's like, oh, okay, that's that's pretty that's pretty different, right? So, like I said, if that flap was closed and the vehicle's unplugged, that should also that should trigger something in your mind. Said, okay, what am I dealing with? I'm dealing with something a little different. Let's do some investigation and see what I got. Okay, just like this vehicle here, you know, you see the charging port right in front of the driver's side door. Now, this is also um, a class we did out in California. This is uh, the police department does has electric motorcycles. So you're starting to see a, a lot more of these on the roadways. And I'm sure people are familiar that Harley Davidson has an electric motorcycle uh, coming out on the market here soon. Now, the difference with the Harley Davidson motorcycle is they also patented the chip to give it that Harley Davidson sound um, as it's going down the road. So like I said, Harley Davidson is one of those that, you know, they want to be with the cool kids, but they don't want to be that cool, right? They want to try to still keep that identity to themselves. And believe it or not, so many electric cars, aftermarket companies are actually putting these chips in these vehicles too to give it uh, that sound, that uh, that nice engine sound. Okay, so we familiar, like I said, this is a distinctive look. You know, we already know about the Tesla Model X. You know, we see a vehicle like this, we automatically know we're dealing with an electric vehicle. You know, the Chevy um, Volt, you know, we know that, you know, even though the Chevy Volt is not going to be manufactured anymore, I think this was the last year or last year was the last year they were actually uh, manufacturing the Chevy Volt. But still, there are a lot of them out there on the roadways today still. The BMW i3, when I talk about the blue accents, if you look inside the grill, you see the uh, on the rocker panel, you see the blue accent. That's an indicator that you're dealing with um, an electric vehicle as well. OK, this is one of the first renderings of the uh, Model S. I'm not Model S, but I'm sorry, the um, the Model 3, this is the older version of the Model S, Prius. And then we're talking about uh, cars that mirror their conventional um, vehicle counterpart, such as this, this is the Hyundai Sonata. So the Hyundai Sonata hybrid vehicle mirrors its conventional vehicle counterpart. And you're starting to see a lot more of that with a lot of different manufacturers out there. So a lot of manufacturers, you know, are going to um, that same uh, um, dynamic because people like the distinct look of the car, the Impalas, um, you know, like the Sonatas, whatever, but they also want the hybrid version as well. They want that that hybrid feel. So they're actually making them mirror the counterparts. So we look at this car. This was taken um, uh, two years ago when I was out at Vegas at the SEMA convention. Uh, I was doing a, a presentation there. This is an aftermarket uh, Mustang Lithium. This is a 100% electric vehicle done aftermarket, 900 horsepower. Right, so we look at the other side to say if this hood is closed, there's nothing to indicate that this is an electric vehicle. On this vehicle, the charging port is actually on the driver's side in the rear, just where the gas port, fuel port would be. So therefore, like I said, if this thing was closed up, there's no blue accents. There's nothing to indicate unless you look at the spoiler on the front, it says lithium. You're like, okay, what does that necessarily mean? You know, lithium doesn't necessarily mean it's an electric vehicle. It's not a, a identifying branding that you're gonna see in a lot of of vehicles so that should pique your interest as well too okay so we talk about opening the hood open up fueling ports or if the drivers are available ask the driver what type of vehicle is this is where i talk about assumptions we can't assume just because we see this vehicle it's like oh guess what that that's not electric vehicle so we're good you know that is not the case like i said this thing is 100 percent electric so we talk about 900 horsepower so just imagine if you take that make that mistake and assume this is a conventional vehicle because you don't hear it running, you're standing in front of it or in the back of it, and the person hits a gas pedal and this thing starts to move. Well, guess what? That's a that's a lot of power behind you. I mean, unless you just got that one guy on your 
crew you really don't like anymore, then you can put that guy in that position. Or if you're in the promotion process and the guy in front of you uh, is in front of the car, therefore you can put him right there and that'll bump you up on that list real quick. Okay. So like I said, options is a major component of all screw ups in the fire service, right? So that's why I said, we have to be safe. We have to do our due diligence. Now, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon for electric vehicles. This is Ferrari's version of their electric vehicle. Also 900 horsepower, right? So like I said, we come across this, you're not gonna think that it's gonna be an electric vehicle, okay? You're gonna think it's conventional. This is Lamborghini's version of the electric vehicle. To me, it looks like the very the, the new Batmobile, which is pretty cool. And I would like to see that in the new Batmobile, uh, Batman movie, that'd be pretty cool. But um, like I said, you're starting to see a lot of these type of, everybody is jumping on the bandwagon for electric vehicles. Now, this was also at the SEMA convention two years ago. This is a 1952 Chevy. So you pull up on this on an accident on the interstate or whatever, and you look at that and say, oh, there's no way that can be an electric vehicle, right? So like I said, it goes back to that one major component of being a, of an assumption that can go wrong. This truck has two, not one, but two Chevy Bolt motors inside this vehicle, right? And on both sides of this motor, you see two charging ports. One on the right side um, is right next to where the coolant is, and the other on the other side is on that uh, firewall. I'm not sorry, the firewall, but the fender. You see another charging port there. Okay, so you're not going to see the charging ports on the exterior of this vehicle. So therefore, when we see this vehicle from when closed up, there's nothing to indicate that this uh, is an electric vehicle, with the exception of you may see E10 written on the, uh, as an emblem on the side uh, panels. So where are the batteries located on this truck? The whole bed of the truck is full of lithium ion batteries. So like I said, now looking at this view, there's no indicator, not on the rear, that you're gonna see that this vehicle is an electric vehicle. So let's go back to assumptions, okay? We can assume that every single vehicle, no matter how old, right? So everybody's seen the Tesla truck, Now, Mercedes-Benz is coming out with their version of the big box truck, and they're actually out there already. So a lot of uh, Volvo is even coming out with the electric truck as well. So everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. We're gonna start seeing a lot more of these vehicles on the roadway, just like Alex mentioned earlier. And I do believe by 2025, GM announced they wanna have 30 different variations of an electric vehicle on the roadway. They also want to eventually to go to 100% electric vehicle, uh, such as a lot of manufacturers do, because they found out it is actually a whole lot cheaper to make an electric vehicle. There's a lot less moving parts. There's not an internal combustion engine. There's not uh, you know all these moving things that you have to contend with to uh, build a car. They can build them a whole lot faster and a whole lot cheaper than a conventional vehicle. So we talk about immobilization. Like I said, it could be as simple as turning that vehicle off, right? Chalking the wheels. You know, keeping your vehicle in a position between uh, you and that car, right? You can use your apparatus as a buffer. Now, the chief won't like that. You know, if that car happens to move and does damage to that vehicle, right? So, therefore, like I said, try to use your head. You know, use your, we have um, chalks on every single apparatus. You know, yes, some apparatus, you know, um, chalks are a little bit bigger than others. And two, some of these vehicles sit a little bit lower to the ground. So, it's going to be difficult to, uh, talk the wheels of these vehicles. So we got to start talking about how are we going to mobilize these vehicles? Can we put a set of four by fours um, in our apparatus to handle that? Actually, one is an I used a tech box <laughs> on, on an apparatus and uh, because the front of the car was set pretty low on the ground, but I use apparatus step chalks for the rear tires. So, I mean, you use whatever you can, right? We improvise, we think outside the box on this job, right? That's what our job is, is all about problem solving. So once again, only thing we ever mess with on these vehicles is a 12 volt battery. We don't cut anything that's orange. We don't cut anything that's blue. We don't cut anything that's yellow. You know, like Hitch, where we live, all day long, it's red and black. Um, that's one thing I hope you, you really can get out of this class as well. Like I said, red and black is where you live, okay? Just like we do in conventional vehicles, we do the same thing for an electric vehicle. We talked about taking the key fob and moving at least 25 feet away. This is what a service disconnect will look like. Service disconnects you're going to see on your uh, nickel metal hydride type batteries. You're going to see these on your hybrid uh, vehicle. 
vehicles. So you got two different types of batteries you want to find in these vehicles. Uh, when we talk about hybrid and we're talking about electric vehicles, most hybrids are going to have the nickel metal hydride, but all electric vehicles are going to have the lithium ion battery. And some hybrids are actually switching to lithium ion batteries as well. Lithium ion batteries are a lot bigger, they're heavier, and they take up a little bit more space in these vehicles as well. So let's skip to, um, let's talk about vehicle fires a little bit. I know we're getting close to time. Um, when we talk, oh, when we talk about disabling, like the Tesla, for instance, and you guys probably know more about the Teslas than I do, but there's uh, sometimes little stickers that has a little fire helmet on there, and it tells uh, firefighters where to locate the 12 volt battery, or if there's not a 12 volt battery, it tells you where to locate a cable where you can cut, and it isolates and cuts the 12 volt system, uh, battery system, like in the Chevy Volt, you open up the back panel in that vehicle, you won't find a 12 volt battery, but you'll find a cable it, with a fire helmet on it says cut here to isolate that uh, high voltage system as well. Okay, just to give you an idea. All right, talk about safety stuff. So we talk about uh, vehicle fires. One of the most important things that too I want you to talk about when we talk about vehicle fires is, is how do we open up the hood of a car uh, when we're dealing with vehicle fires? You know, the country, you know, East Coast, West Coast is a little different. And every time I teach a class out in California, it seems like everybody out there likes to open up hoods with a K-12 right? Go big or go home, right? You know, you know, out here in the Midwest or out West, we, you know, we use other different methods. You know, we like to use hand tools. We use the Halligan tool. So both tools, you know, we have to look at different ways of how to utilize them because underneath the hood of these cars is what they call it an inverter converter box. And that inverter converter box takes high voltage cable uh, power to operate and run your low voltage systems. And that inverter converter box is located in different areas in that engine compartment. So let's say you take that Halligan tool or you take uh, the K12, you make that cut across that hood of the car, and you come across that high voltage box, that's going to be all she wrote. You know, we're talking about either a firefighter funeral or, you know, disabling injury, right? So we have to look at other ways of how can we open up that hood of that vehicle? You know, we always do the try before you pry method, right? You know, be smart, work smarter, not necessarily harder. Oh, we also look at other ways, you know, we can look at prying up the hood, trying to ex expose the hinges so we can use maybe possibly use boat cutters, cut the hinges and open up the vehicle that way. But we have to get out of that mindset of always wanting to tear things up. You know, we always got that Mongo guy, the crew that just loves to tear things up, right? Because that's what we get paid to do. We get paid good money to uh, tear things up and destroy things. So same thing with the Halligan tool. You know, a Halligan tool will put more holes in the hood of that car to pry it open you know, we can actually just shoot water through it because we would turn it into Swiss cheese, right? But same principle there. We take that spike of that tool and you come in contact with that inverter converter box and that's still going to be all she wrote, right? We got metal on metal, uh, metal hitting an uh, electric um, uh, box or whatever, okay? So that's disastrous for us. We don't want to do anything like that, right? Actually, my computer's about to die for some reason here. All right, so... Um, so we try to get into that aspect. So when we talk about how do we put out the fires inside these vehicles? So can we use water? And the question answer is absolutely. You know, we can drive these vehicles in, in the rain. You can drive them um, on the roadway, right? So these cars are not eels. So we tell people, yes, you can actually throw, absolutely throw water on it. The only difference is it's gonna take a lot more water, not only to extinguish, but also to cool the uh, batteries down, right? So we talk about that. So we talk about where's the location of these batteries. They're located either underneath the rear seat or in the floor uh, floorboard of the car. So what are those batteries covered by? Either upholstery or carpet. So we can't get water directly onto that battery to cool it down. So when we talk about the Chevy uh, Volt, for instance, uh, multiple tests have been done. And on average, it, you know, um, worst case scenario, it took 2,600 gallons of water, not only to extinguish that fire, but also to cool that battery casing down. Because what we're trying to do is draw that heat out of that battery so it doesn't uh, reignite again. And I know there's been some instances out in California, we've had vehicle accidents or even vehicle fires where the car could catch on fire, you know, 24 to 48 hours after the fact. And that is uh, a possibility. It can happen. Just like, you know, um, you know, anything in a fire, right? I mean, house fires, we get rekindles, 
but well, we don't get rekindles. We just get someone to set the fire again. So that's a, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Right. So like I said, we tell people, you know, just throw as much water as you can. Just like we treat like a dumpster fire. We try to fill that car up with as much water and we throw as much water as you can. But people's like, man, I don't want to ask for a second engine on a, on a vehicle fire because most apparatus, like our engines only carry 500 gallons of water. So if I don't have a hydrant, guess what? I'm going to have to call for another engine. But I tell people the flip side of that is you do not want to be called for a rekindle on a car fire, right? That's a lot more embarrassing than being called on a rekindle on a residence fire. So therefore, use the water you got. It's you know, well, in the Midwest is a great abundance. So out, out west, uh, I'm sorry, in the middle, out west is not so much. Okay, so like I said, you can put water on these. When we talk about extrications, real quick, I know we're getting close. Uh, peeling and peaking. You know, we're not only peeling and peaking for airbag because now you can find 13, 15 airbags in these vehicles, but we're also peeling and peaking to try to find where those high voltage cables may be running. They could be in the rocker panel. They could be like in a Tesla. They can go up the um, the uh, A pillar on the passenger side. So we talk about doing a dash lift or modified dash roll, you know, we have to make that relief cut. Well, there's things behind that uh, pillar that we cannot cut into such as the inverter converter box and also orange cabling back here. So peeling and peaking it is very, very important too when we start doing extrication, not only for airbags, but also for orange cables. So um, like I said, I know this was pretty quick. <laughs> you know, we got, uh, you know, try to cover a lot of information which is, um, you know, it's kind of to wrap your head around. I know, I understand that. But like I said, just remember, you're getting a condensed version of this class. I mean, it's, you know, typically it's about six to seven hours long. Like I said, we get into a lot more information uh, on these vehicles. So uh, real quick, we'll, you know, open up for some questions if anybody has any questions. Yeah, please go ahead and use the chat feature if you've got any questions. I know we are, you know, running a little short on time, but if anyone's got a question they'd like to uh, ask Captain Wilmock's opinion about, I'm scanning and don't see that anything's come in yet. And if you do, I mean, I do, I want to say thank you to the Clean Seas Coalitions for uh, giving us the opportunity to do this class. Like I said, they are great resources. Like I said, Alex pulled up some uh, information on how many electric vehicles you have out there on the roadways, charging stations. Like I said, they are great resources to to uh, utilize, especially in our line of work. Because like I said, sometimes we want to pull that data every once in a while, just to give us an idea, especially where our charging station is located, how many we have in our areas as well. Um, if you have any officers, you know, I always tell people, look at those apps. It doesn't hurt, you know, try to, if you're out driving, coming back from a run, keep your eye out, look at uh, the corners, look on the side streets, you know, um, where your charging station is located. I also, you know, do it when I'm, you know, driving down the roadway anyway. I, I try to look at, you know, identify a vehicle next to me if it's a hybrid or not. So it just gives me something to look for. Like I said, maybe something different that I, I have never seen before. So always be um, cognizant of what's around you. Like I said, the technology is out there. It's only going to get bigger. We're going to see a lot more and more on the roadways. Like I said, in 2035, and they're trying to make it to where it's going to be, you know, illegal to even purchase a conventional vehicle. They want something that's going to be either a hybrid or electric vehicle or some type of uh, low emissions vehicle. So Chris, we're going to be we, we do have one question that's come in um, that you'd mentioned yeah. um, to watch for a thermal wave. And um, one of our participants would like to know if you could expand on that a little bit. So when we talk about that thermal wave, so remember when we talk about the, the battery heating up, so even during a collision, you know, that battery is not designed just like, you know, cars are not designed to hit things on impact. So that battery case is not designed really to take a lot of force. So sometimes you'll have that thing called, we call thermal runaway. So it's like electrical fire. So that battery may slowly heat up. So you talk about using your ticks and try to determine, hey, is that is the temperature of that battery case something I need to be concerned about? Is it continuing to heat up? Because the last thing you want to do is have that car be a tow to a, a lot, uh, catch on fire. The next thing you know, you've got, you know, 20, 30 cars to catch on fire. We've <laughs> It seems like we have two of those a year um, at the same lot. Someone, you know, you know, catches a, gets a car, catch on fire, and we got a whole lot uh, of burning of cars. So that's why we talk about with like arson investigators. Uh, we even teach tow truck operators. So when we tow one of these vehicles, it has to be put into a lot, isolated from itself for at least 24 hours. So we don't have that thermal runaway. Um, I said, you may be on scene and that battery looks good with your tick, but 24 to 40 hours later, that thing can be slowly heating up and 
I mean, I don't necessarily know. I mean, it's probably different, but if you see something, you know, maybe a couple hundred degrees or something where you talk about, um, you see your know, upholstery starting to be discolor or you start seeing off gassing, that would be an indicator. Hey, we need, probably need to soak this thing down and said, just, just fill it up, make it into an aquarium. Right. Any other questions? That's all I've got there for right now. Let's see. And, um, uh, Alex Economy just put in uh, the chat box for everyone a uh, link to a website where you can track how many electric vehicles are on the road in California. So if you hit your little chat balloon, even if you didn't have a question, you can see the um, information that Alex is sharing there. Alex also shared the links for the plugshare.com and for the um, energy department's list of stations, EV stations. So you may want to check those links out too. It's www.plugshare.com and AFDC, that's afdc.energy.gov slash stations slash pound signed slash find slash nearest. Leave it to the government to come up with a real and I would use, URL. <laughs> right. and, and, and honestly, I would use both of them. Um, just like if we have hazmat instance, right? You know, we're looking up a chemical we use multiple resources same thing here because there's one me one app that may not be updated whereas the other one will be because i've i've seen that uh, especially in my area because i pulled up before and said i know there's a, um, a charging station in that area and i pull up the other app and one will show it and the other one has not been updated yet so i would say utilize both of those apps and and like i said just, just do your due diligence look in your area try to see what's out there well, thanks, Chris. Really appreciate it. Um, like to see if uh, if uh, Alex or Georgia have any um, final words they'd like to share with our um, participants. Yeah, thanks, Trina. Um, I'd just like to thank all the first responders for tuning into today's training, um, and also for all the work that you do to make your communities a safer place to live. Um, I'd also like to thank Chris for his wonderful presentation, as well as my co-host. Georgia and the Clean Cities Coachella Valley region for helping to sponsor and organize today's training. Um, lastly, just a quick reminder for folks that tomorrow we will be hosting another first responder training on gaseous fuel vehicles. And hopefully you all have received the sign up information for tomorrow's training. But if not, feel free to reach out to one of us and we can send you the info. Um, and back to you, Trina. Well, thank you. And, and also as a final reminder, um, in, you know, in a couple of days or so, you'll be receiving an email from our sponsors with a link to today's presentation once we get that uh, up online so that you can go back and review or share with your colleagues who may not have been able to attend today. Just let them know that this is available and, um, and we will be sending a tip sheet primarily on um, identification of vehicles. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us and wish you a great day. Thank you.